You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. As a result of the rebellion of Israel, those enemies of theirs who move there decide very quickly they don't want to stay there. What was it Mark Twain said? Between the poisonous spiders, the poisonous snakes, the high heat, and the lack of water, why would anybody want to be here? For centuries, nobody wanted it, okay? Nobody wanted to stay there. Nobody wanted to be there. You hear these stories of, oh, it's our homeland. It's where we're from. No, it's not. In the 19th century, Jews began to return. No one else was. There was no one else there. Israel is one of the most contested and fought over pieces of territory in the world. It's amazing that such a small piece of land is the source of several wars and controversies. But as Pastor Ken teaches you in today's message, for almost 2,000 years, nobody wanted to live there. Once the Jews left the land, God's blessings over the land also left, and it became a dry, barren desert. It was only when Jews started moving back that it started raining and producing crops again. You and I are witnessing Bible prophecies fulfilled. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 35, as he continues his message, Condemnation Equals Rejoicing. At the time of Jesus, the people were still looking for the Messiah, who he, they thought would bring everybody back to the country. So they weren't all back. Even when Jesus was there, they still weren't all back. Um, remember what it says in Acts where all the folks in the temple heard Jesus speak in their own language? These were all Jews from all over the place there for Passover and for Pentecost, and they heard this. They weren't natives to Jerusalem. They weren't natives to Israel, but they were Jewish, and they were there specifically for that event. It says that God will gather them all back, and we're going to cover that as we get a little further into Ezekiel, but what happened in 1948? Israel declared itself to be independent, and they started moving in large numbers. There are now more Jews in Israel than anywhere else in the world. That just changed recently. There used to be more actually here in the United States, and I think at one point there were more Jews living in Boca Raton than there were in Tel Aviv. But that's not the case anymore. It's just not. Um, the elements to this actually began back in World War I. Now remember, I talked about the folk fact that folks started moving back in the 1880s and the 1890s. That's when you had this movement that was created to uh, return to Israel. And then after World War I, uh, what was promised in that land, uh, again, from 137 AD to about 1900, uh, there was drought. Nothing but drought. Leviticus 26 says that. It says, you'll perish among the nations, your enemy's land will consume you, so those who went to Babylon, didn't, many of them didn't come back. Those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies, and also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers and their unfaithfulness, which they've committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled, then they'll make amends for their iniquity, and I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I'll remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land, for the land will be abandoned by them. And that happened. That actually did happen as a result of being taken captive to Babylon. It happened again as a result of the Bar Kokhba rebellion. And the blessings on that land left as the Jews left. There were no blessings taking place. It was abandoned and it was left kind of a, as a horrible place. God actually says in the latter portion of that scripture, I will not reject them, nor will I abhor them to destroy them, but breaking my covenant with them, I'm their Lord, their God. God's going to restore them at some point and restore the land. He's going to remember his people, even though the land's going to be desolate. And the land was desolate for 1,900 years. Not a lot of people living there. All of this is to show that in spite of Edom participating in the destruction of Israel and Nobody being able to live there, they still want to be there. They still think it's theirs. Because after all, I mean, they got cheated out of the birthright. And that's still going on today. But what happened as a result of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, nobody lived there. The Turks actually tried to settle 
a couple hundred thousand people in Jerusalem around the, about 1500, they, they lasted for about a hundred years and all went home to Turkey. It just wasn't working out well for them. But in 1880, uh, Jewish refugees from Russia and other parts of Europe began to settle in that area. In 1897, we had the first Zionist conference held in Basel, Switzerland. And in 1917, Britain signed uh, with the Balfour Declaration said that they support a Jewish home state in that area. And then they captured Jerusalem during World War I. Uh, they also uh, were involved with working with Saudi Arabia, and there was a guy named, uh, they had a British officer who was riding with them the entire time. During the period of absence of most of the Jews, the land remained desolate. There was nobody there. The Jews weren't there, so the blessing of God, well, there were a few Jews who lived there, but they weren't there returning under the blessing of God, and as a result, it was just kind of a desolate land. Leviticus 26.32, again, I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled by it. That's from the uh, Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh. But it makes it very clear that as a result of the rebellion of Israel, those enemies of theirs who move there decide very quickly they don't want to stay there. What was it Mark Twain said? Between the poisonous spiders, the poisonous snakes, the high heat and the lack of water, why would anybody want to be here? For centuries, nobody wanted it. Okay? Nobody wanted to stay there. Nobody wanted to be there. You hear these stories of, oh, it's our homeland. It's where we're from. No, it's not. In the 19th century, Jews began to return. No one else was. There was no one else there. But it started raining again when the Jews returned, and it started turning green. One of the things that's very interesting is that if you go to Israel today and you try to identify if there are any trees that are in excess of 100 to 140 years of age, you're not going to find them. Reason being, they can't, they couldn't grow. There was no water. It didn't, didn't happen. They're actually reforesting some sections in southern Israel even now that at one time were forest and now it's turning into forest again. But as a result of all of this happening, another group decided, oh, I want this land. It's mine. And who is that group? It's the Edomites. They're the ones who are going to do that. They wanted it way back at the time of Ezekiel, and it hasn't changed. What we see in the prophetic utterances in Ezekiel 25, and now again in 35 and 36, is a setting up of what's going to be the end game, which we're going to see further in the Scriptures. At some point in the near future, Israel will stop negotiating with the Palestinians, Edomites. Psalm 83, we've talked about, it outlines what nations are involved in that. That's a, a short war that will take place, and Israel will solve the problem once and for all. But we see, digging into the whole story of those nations outlined by Ezekiel, that there's going to be a takeover of major sections of the Middle East at some point here in the near future by Israel, to the point that it'll almost look like the land that was promised by God. Not quite, but close. They'll have Egypt. They're going to have some cities in Egypt. They're going to have this area of Edom. They're going to have everything uh, east and west of the Jordan River, to include all of Jordan and some sections of Syria as well. It, it's coming. And when? We don't know. That's the big thing. I wish we did. Uh, that means that Jesus returning for us is that much quicker. Okay, let's get to the text. Chapter thir That's all my introduction, okay? So chapter 35, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir. Now, Mount Seir is the homeland of the Edomites. And prophesy against it, and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, Mount Seir, and I'll stretch out my hand against you and make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay waste your cities, and you will become a desolation. And you'll know that I'm the Lord, because you've had everlasting enmity. That's a term, underlying that. We're going to get back to that. You've had everlasting enmity and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their punishment of the end. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will give you over to bloodshed, and bloodshed will pursue you, since you've not hated bloodshed. 
Therefore, bloodshed will pursue you. Have you noticed the, the Palestinian Authority and the Hamas and that they're constantly having people killed? That's what God is saying here. It's not going to disappear from them. I'll make Mount Seir a waste and a desolation, and I will cut off from it the one who passes through and returns. I will fill its mountains with its slain. On your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines, those slain by the sword will fall. I will make you an everlasting desolation, and your cities will not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Because you've said, these two nations and these two lands, he's talking about Israel, will be mine. And we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will deal with you according to your anger and according to your envy, which you showed because of your hatred against them. So I'll make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have heard all your revilings, which you've spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they are laid desolate, they are given to us for food. And you have spoken arrogantly against me, and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard it, thus says the Lord God. As all the earth rejoices, I will make you a desolation. As you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so I'll do to you. You will be a desolation, O Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it. Then they will know that I am the Lord." Happy promises for the people of Edom. Not really. Uh, it's judgment. But it's also, this is the future for Israel. Israel, you can tell, looking at this, has got something to do with what's going to happen to Edom. But we have this reference here to these two peoples, again, the northern and the southern tribe. And remember, Ezekiel has already been talking about them being one. He's been talking about those two nations, not separate. He's talking about Israel as a combined nation again. Is Israel today a northern and southern country? No, it's one nation, right? They have one king, one prime minister. But this is kind of Ezekielian language. I made that up. The entire land, even though Judah is the one who was surviving up to the time of its destruction, God is saying, because you did this at the point of their collapse, in other words, guiding in Nebuchadnezzar and guiding in all their troops and assisting killing Israel, because you did this, I'm going to get revenge on you. Remember they said they had this everlasting enmity, this revenge thing going on, this vengeance? God says, you don't know anything about revenge or vengeance. I will take care of it. This is part of the transition. You're going to transition to restoration, but it makes sense that because of restoration, Edom's targeted and has to be dealt with. God's going to restore Israel. He's going to eliminate Edom permanently. And he, and he actually says he's going to use Israel to do it. Mount Seir. Now, that, that was a term that shows up here in this section of Scripture. What is Mount Seir? It's actually a term for the mountainous region uh, of, in this part of the country of Israel. There's a rift valley that goes from the Dead Sea all the way down towards the, um, towards the Red Sea. And this rift valley was referred to as Mount Seir. Now, there are towns in this uh, one is called Petra or Selah. Uh, it's also known, if you're really interested in knowing it, Jilba Ashsara. There you go. But the area that we know of Edom, again, you see the Dead Sea to the north. And if you go due south, you can see the Rift Valley. You see the, 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 the deep rift uh, along the eastern side of the Dead Sea. That's what's called Mount Seir. That's what they referred it to. That was all part of Edom at that time that whole area. And they have, again, a little town there called Petra. Notice the color of the ground. Red. Very red. By the way, this is where many of those who are going to survive the tribulation from the land of Israel will hide out. They'll be hiding out here. And they've carved these structures directly into the stone. Uh, so that's kind of, that's one of the communities there. There's if you actually go a little bit to the east of that, there's a major freeway running north and south, and there's a bunch of communities there. Uh, and you can go north up into, uh, further into Jordan, up to the capital of Jordan at Amman, or you can go south into Saudi Arabia. It depends upon which direction you want to go. If you go north, it gets cooler. You go south, it gets a little bit warmer. It just depends upon which, you know, what, you, what, what trips you trigger in terms of temperatures. So what are the crimes that Edom did that God is actually tying the restoration of Israel to the destruction of the Edomites. 
Well, it's in Ezekiel 35.5. Because you've had everlasting enmity and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of the punishment of the end. So point one, why they're being taken care of. Everlasting enmity. The Hebrew term here is olam eba. Olam, which is the word for we translate to everlasting, means long time. Usually it means eternal. So when the birthright was taken away from Esau and Jacob cheated him from the blessing, that's where it started. That was a long time ago. About 2,900, 3,000 years. So I think Olam meets that standard. Long time. Eba is the other Hebrew term. It means enmity or hostile disposition. So you think Esau was a little bit ticked about what happened? Well, in Genesis 27, 41 and 42, we find out how much Esau loved his brother Jacob. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing his father had given to his brother. And he never got over it. He swore to kill his brother. God stopped that from happening. But he's still trying to kill Jacob even today. So the descendants of Esau still have that hatred. And it's cultivated by Satan, of course, who's really behind all of the uh, anti-Semitic stuff that's going on. But you see here where it began. And there's more about this hatred and more going on in the book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah is all about judgment coming on the nation of Edom. Uh, and it's a vision, it it's shows that. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We've heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations saying, Arise, and let us go against her for battle. So he's talking about what's going to happen in the end of the age, when Edom gets destroyed. I will make you small among the nations. So how large is the Palestinian Authority today, if you were to take a look at the, the, their desire to have an, an additional country? Not very big, is it? Okay. I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. So who likes them? I mean, everybody's using them to try and be able to get what they want from Israel. But in reality, they don't have a whole lot of allies, do they? Here's, here's the background. When these folks called the Palestinians were initially settled in what is today Israel, the surrounding nations in 1948 said, look, we're going to attack Israel, we're going to take them over, they won't be a country very long, why don't you move out for a little while so we don't hurt anybody when we come through, when we're done you can move back to your homes. That's what they were told. Guess who won the war? Israel. They decided, well, we can't go back. Israel wasn't going to stop them. They could, they could absolutely move back to their homes. Israel, no problem with that. But they didn't go back. So they tried to settle in Egypt. Egypt didn't want them. They tried to settle in Jordan. Jordan didn't want them. They tried to settle in Lebanon, and they actually started a civil war there. They, Lebanon kicked them out. So now they're in the Gaza Strip, and they're in some of the communities in the West Bank. And they're greatly despised even by the countries that they think are helping them. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. This is what it says in Obadiah. Do you think that they're deceived today? Well, I think they are. You who live in the clefts of the rock, again talking about where they live, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Have you noticed that Hamas and Hezbollah have a little bit of a pride problem? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there... I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, how you would be ruined? Would they not steal only until they had enough? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border. Not once, but they've done it several times, all the people who are allied with them. Remember how they did it in 1948 again? They said, just leave the country for a while, we'll take over. They sent them to the border. It says here that that was going to happen. And the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There's no understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman. 
that's the, one of the cities in, in uh, Edom, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter because of the violence to your brother Jacob. There you have it again. You will be covered with shame. You'll be cut off forever. They're not going to come back. Once they're gone, they're gone. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were as one of them. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. And do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. This is all stuff they actually did when Nebuchadnezzar moved in. Uh, and do not loot their wealth. They did that too in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives. And do not imprison their survivors in the day of the distress. The day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you've done it, it'll be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They'll drink and swallow and become as if they'd never existed. But on Mount Zion, there'll be those who escape and it'll be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob will be a fire. And the house of Joseph a flame but the house of Esau will be a stubble. There you have the promise again that Israel is going to be the one that finally deals with the Esau-Edom problem. And they'll set them on fire and consume them so there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau. So the folks who are living in the Negev will just move over and take it over. Those of the Shephelah in the Philistine plain also possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria. And Benjamin will possess Gilead and the exiles of the host of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sherephad will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend to Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. That's a picture of what's going to happen at the end of the age. Does that sound like really good news for Edom? No, absolutely not. So again, point one of this indictment everlasting in enmity. They're going to get destruction because of this hatred that they've never got over. Point two of the indictment. Ezekiel 35.10 Because you have said these two nations and these two lands will be mine and we will possess them. Although the Lord was there. They recognized it was God's land, it was God's to give, but they're going to take it anyhow. They don't care. Can I share something with you from the Hamas Charter, Article 14? This is current. Palestine is an Islamic land where the first Qibla and the third holiest site are located. That's the Dome of the Rock located in uh, Jerusalem. That is also the place whence the prophet, be Allah's prayer and peace upon him, ascended to heavens. So not only does Hamas claim the land, this is in their charter, and this is where they're saying it's ours because we have that there, it's always ours. So they claim the land, and so does Hezbollah, and so does the PLO. And by the way, none of them get along with each other. I think that's interesting too. But again, point two, per Ezekiel, the Edomites, who were called Edomians during the period of time of Christ, and by the way, the, one of their guys was ruling over Israel at the time. His name was Herod. He was an Edomian, an Edomite. Today they're called Palestinians. They claim Israel all of it for themselves and in the Hamas charter they actually say well it's because back in around 800 AD we built or 900 AD we built this thing on, on the temple mount that's why it's ours you've been listening to a message from Ezekiel on the unsafe bible Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this major prophet to help us all understand how to apply these messages to our lives today. Have you ever found yourself falling into the trap of sin, suffering the consequences, and then only after you realize it's too late, you offer up a prayer and ask God, why me? It's a classic case of you made your bed and now you have to sleep in it, but you still ask the question as if to suggest you may not be guilty. Well. As we see here in Ezekiel, that has been one of man's greatest weaknesses throughout history. If you want to hear more, don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. Once there, use the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. 
Just fill out the form and we'll reach out to you. To listen to this message or any others from Pastor Ken, just look under the media tab at theunsafebible.com. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you can show us your support for the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. No gift is too big or too small and will help us continue to reach the lost with God's Word. Any other questions? Feel free to explore theunsafebible.com for more information about when and where we meet. Directions can be found on the Contact tab. We're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and want to invite you to join us in person for our next service. Until then, we want to thank you for joining us right here on The Unsafe Bible.